with me if you want to, because it's a very powerful principle that the Lord tries to teach us, and it says this. It says, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. Actually, I don't, I want a different translation. Sorry, give me a minute. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. This is the NIV. It's like precious oil poured on the head, anointing oil, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Mount Hermon were falling on Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, his life forevermore. Here's a principle that a lot of churches lose sight of, and Satan sees it as an Achilles heel. Ready? The unity of the brethren is vital for the anointing to flow. The second the devil sees the anointing begin to pour out, he knows the way to short-circuit that is to disrupt the unity of the brethren. He'll turn people against their pastor. He'll turn husbands against wives. He'll turn children against fathers and mothers. What you'll see is an attempt to disrupt the unity of the brethren. Because if he can do that, he can stymie the flow of that anointing that pours from the head down. Understand? And so as you see revival begin to pour out more and more and more in this church, and I believe we are headed towards a major work of the Holy Spirit in this church. And the Holy Spirit can do that with three people, with 12 people, with 1,000 people. It doesn't matter. The Holy, the Holy Spirit doesn't see numbers. He sees obedience, and he sees hunger for his spirit. If he sees that, and he starts pouring his spirit out, watch how the enemy will try to attack by disrupting that unity. You and I, we have to make a covenant that we're not going to let that happen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, and our hearts are hungry to hear from your word tonight. We want to be fed, and we want to be filled, and we want to be strengthened by your word. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we ask you to speak to us. Wash us with the water of your word, that we would not leave here the same, but that you would build our faith. You would build our resolve. You would intensify our relationships with you so that we would walk more effectively as your representatives here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. I want you to turn to your study sheet. I want to discuss something with you guys tonight. More and more, uh, uh, and maybe it was just this week, because you know the stupid same-sex marriage issue is coming up. And I urge you, by the way, every single one of you, uh, uh, because we need to stand up for righteousness, and it is not righteous uh, uh, for us to refer to an institution that God implemented, namely marriage, to be attributed to same-sex couples. That's not his will, and that's not what he wants. It's an abomination to him for a man to lie with a man and a woman to lie with a woman like that. Can I hear an amen? And so we can't be supporting laws that enable people to do sinful things. Okay? So I heartily encourage you to call your congressman. And let me tell you this, by the way, not congressman, but your representative or your state senator. And I'll tell you why I'm urging you to call. Because it's with the human voice that that is trans transmitted. Now, I, I had a lot of meetings to be at this week that caused pastors uh, of churches to come together and address Chris, Chris Lee, as actually tomorrow morning, Cynthia was today. Uh, 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 we, we have another meeting with, with the Foursquare about how we're going to attack on Moss to do this. And I urge you, in Jesus' name, to re not rely upon us big heavy hitters to go in there. Because I've got to tell you something about the meeting with C Cynthia Thielen today. She wasn't moved by it. She already knows when a group of pastors walks in the room, all they're going to do is yap at her a bunch of theology about how they're against it. So the second she, said, she hears, we have 25 windward pastors that all want to come in and talk to you about their opinion about same-sex marriage, she already knows what their opinion are. So she's filed in her brain, okay, there's 25 pastors on the windward side that don't like same-sex marriage. And in one ear and out the other. What doesn't go in their ear and out the other is when you, one of their constituents, calls on your own, and in very simple language, just tell her, I'm not in support of this. And she asks you why. And it doesn't have to be Cynthia Thielen. She just happens to be the, the state senator in charge of this area. Rep, representative. Who's the senator in this, in this area? I know for me, it's Isaac Choi and Brickwood Galuteria. Yeah, but anyway, um, they hear you. And you just, in, in the simplest terms possible, just tell them, you know what? I'm against this. I don't want it. And they're called representatives and senators for a reason. They're supposed to represent what you want in the legislature. 
And if you don't say anything, they're under the impression right now, your, your city councilman, your state representative is, is, is under the impression right now that you're in favor of this thing. That's what they're saying because they haven't heard from people who call them and tell them, I just don't want this. So do that, okay? And, and if you want, you can text me or you can ask me, how do I get in touch with my you know, representative, my senator, and, and I'll help you do that. Just text me or, or, or something like that. But do that this week. Can I hear an amen to that? Okay, let's move on to the word now. First, uh, and the reason I raised that up is because of this. I've heard a whole bunch of arguments about how science that says this, and it's positive, and it's a good effect on kids, and it's a good effect on family, it's going to be good for the economy, and yada, yada, yada. You know what? I don't give a rip what science or anybody else says. Because to me, I think basically the world science is a bunch of ballyhoo. Take a look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross... Jesus died, took your sins, died on the cross. His blood paid for your sins. If you believe that he's the son of God and believe that God raised him from the, from the dead, you shall be saved. It says here, the message of the cross is foolishness. Moria, if, for any of you guys that are Lord of the Rings fans. Moria is a Greek word. It means stupid. It means infantile. It, it actually doesn't mean stupid so much as it means dumb. It, it's kind of like uh, you know, a, a, a child who believes... You know, in the Easter Bunny or something. You know, it, it's like an infantile belief. Well, that's basically what this word says in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 18. It says, for the message of the cross is moria, foolishness. They, they see it as childish. They see it as fabulistic. That's the way they're going to respond to it. To those who are perishing, that is people who, who don't have not accepted Jesus yet and are on their way to perdition. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. How many would say amen to that? It's the power of God. So to us, it's different. We see the word of God differently. We feel it in our hearts differently. As they do, they're going to see it as foolishness. They're going to see it as more. And one of the reasons why is because of this introduction of what they call science. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 says this. O Timothy, this is Paul talking to Timothy now. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. You've been told about God. You've been told about Jesus and the righteousness that faith in his blood provides. Can I hear an amen? You've heard that God created the earth. You've heard that God did all these miracles. It drives me crazy, you know, Elder, when I watch History Channel and Discovery Channel, and they try to figure out how God did this miracle, that maybe this dam could have burst and this water could have come down and this mud could have washed and that's how God did it. Listen, God doesn't need anything like that. He can do miracles. He transcends physical reality. And it drives me bats when people try to figure out a, a, a natural reason how something could be mistaken for a miracle. Miracles are miracles. But so, so keep what is committed to thy trust. God wants you to retain full faith in his word. He wants you to believe every single thing he says. And to warn you, he says this, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science. Say that with me. Oppositions of science, one more time, oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Gnoseos is the word that's used here in this particular passage. And it means what purports to be empirical, quantitative knowledge. All based on what people can see and what people can measure. That's why the King James translated that word as science but it's science falsely called. Here, the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul to speak to his son in the, in, in, in the, in the Lord Timothy, he says, avoid profane and vain battle, babblings. People who tell you they are scientists, people who tell you they know things about the physical reality of the world are going to babble at you things. That's what God sees it as, is babble. Oh, well, you know, the universe is made up like this, and the, the universe started like this. It started with a big bang. No, it didn't. It started with this implosion. No, it didn't. It started with this explosion. No, it didn't. It started with this you know, uh, uh, Higgs boson uh, passing through a field, and it was a zero-mass you know, particle, but then that zero-mass particle became, began to gain mass because it passed through this field. And I look at these guys thinking that they've cracked the code, and now they've figured out you know, how the universe started. I, and I'm like, where did the particle come from? Where did the field come from? You're still back to root one. You're, still, you're changing the language, trying to make it sound more intense and more esoteric. But at the end of the day, it's, a still, it's still the same stupid argument. Where did it come from? So anyway, they have all these different 
you know, postulate uh, 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 hypotheses as to how everything began, falsely called, while some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace be with thee, amen. So even back then, during the first century, the early believers were faced with people who claimed they had scientific proof that God and his word, God doesn't exist, and his word is fabulistic or mythological. And there's a full court press now. When you, are as a, you as a Christian stand up for righteousness, one of the attacks that's going to come against you is that the Bible is all made up. It's just a whole bunch of, uh, of men. I, just, I, I was on Christian Post the other day, and, and somebody has this crazy idea and notion that the book of Isaiah was actually written by Constantine in 326 or something like that, and there was no real book of Isaiah, but actually it was made up, and you know the Catholic Church is where it stemmed from, and I'm like, you know... Your, your problem is, I, I've been to the, the Dome of the Book in, in Israel, and I've seen the scroll of Isaiah that was dug up you know, in Qumran, and I, I know it was dated you know, over 150 years before Christ was even born, and your argument doesn't make any sense. But nonetheless, here's what I find. I find that on that blog where this guy is trying to say, Constantine wrote it, and this is how he vilified the Jews, and this is how he, he built the Catholic Church, there's like hundreds of people chiming in, aha, that makes sense. Makes so, and, and all they have to do is say, there's total, there's massive amounts of archaeological proof that has now you know, blown the cover off of Christianity and declared how false it is. And I'm like, look at this, guy. I've seen it. I've seen the book of Isaiah. I've seen it with my own eyes. But these people want to believe that the Bible is false. They want to believe there's no God. They want to believe that they can go ahead and live their lives however they want, and they don't have to be accountable to God, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. And so what they'll try to do is decry Christianity. You're going to face this. More and more as we enter the days of Noah and Lot, you're going to face this. And you're going to be surrounded by family. You're going to be surrounded by friends. You're going to be surrounded by work people who are going to treat you as though you are Moria. They're going to talk to you like you're stupid because they see the preaching of the cross as something that is foolish. I just talked to John Andreessen. And he just has motorcycles stolen again. And here's what he said, and you, 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 you tell him if I'm exaggerating or not, but he wrote me a letter and he said, my motorcycle got stolen right as I'm in the middle of fasting and praying, so I know I'm on the right track. Okay, that's the kind of faith that John Andreessen has. And basically what he's saying is this, I know when the devil starts attacking me, I'm doing something right. Now, when people treat you as Moria and they talk to you like that, you're supposed to rejoice because you then are able to discern and understand that you're speaking God's truth and you're declaring the truth of the Word of God. So, you know, if some of you, I, I, in fact, if, if these guys who hate God and don't believe in the Bible and want to embrace everything evil and everything ungodly start complimenting me and thinking I'm a champion of theirs, I know I'm doing something wrong. I know I'm off track. I actually want people who hate Jesus to hate me too. Is that all right? Because that's what Jesus said. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. If you are in me. So, praise God for that. But anyway, Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words, you're supposed to look at the heavens, you're supposed to look at the earth, and everything that he's created declares his glory. You and I were just at Camp Mukulaya, and we were talking on, on Saturday morning, I think it was, or maybe it was Sunday morning, as we were standing there watching the, 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 the rain wash across the horizon, or we were staring at the sky at night, and you can actually see stars there. In fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but Joe Lancor here, he's got a degree in astrophysics. And he was able to um, verify that, yes, that is Venus. <laughs> yeah, he must be smart because he thought I was right. Anyway, what? Uh, yeah, but, uh, 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 you know, but we were there looking at the stars, and we were realizing it's easier... People have asked me before, why is it easier to believe in God when you're in a place like that? I said, because right here, when we're in this room, we're surrounded by everything man-made. It's actually God's man that he made 
that made it. But it's hard to make that jump. We look around. We're surrounded by a world that we made it, that we created. We're surrounded by a virtual world. If you live in a kind of lifestyle where half of your life and half of your mental energy is spent on television, guess what? You're going to be filled with just man-made imagery. But when you are standing there on the shoreline of Camp Mukalaya and all you can see are stars and you can feel the breeze blowing on you and you see the moon and you see the clouds, you can hear the waves, you realize this is greater than anything they can show on TV. This is better than CGI. And it's all God made. And you're surrounded in his world now. And you start to realize how insignificant and small man's contribution is. The most gorgeous building in the world can't equal what I was looking at when I was standing there at that shoreline. Can I hear an amen from everybody but you? So, the, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12 says, but God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom. He founded the world by his wisdom. He constructed everything we know in physical reality because he was wise and he understands how all this stuff is supposed to work. In fact, the reason it works like this is because he designed it to and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. It wasn't his power that caused the heavens to stretch out. It was his understanding, comprehension of what he wanted that caused all this to take place. How much science is there in the Bible? Because what people would have you believe is that the Bible is a collection of mythological, fabulistic, literary texts. And there is no sound science in it at all. In fact, it's just like, you know, a story about Pan and the golden flute or something. It's all made up. Is that true? I'm going to submit a couple things to you tonight. I, I only had about 10 of them. These are, my, th these are some of my favorites. There, there, are, there are hundreds in the Bible, if you, if you have the kind of mind to look for it, that declare the scientific accuracy of what was said to the prophets. In, in the Bible, but I want to build your faith. Is that all right tonight? Can I spend a, a couple minutes just building your faith and assuring you that as these people try to challenge you with science falsely called, that they don't understand truly what the Word of God says? One of my favorites, actually it might be my favorite, is found in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He formed out of dust. Now see, scientists will look at that and say, well, that's stupid, because a man is of different composition than dust. And what I would say is, you don't understand Hebrew. You don't understand the language that God chose to write his you know, original text in. Because if you did, you would know that the word for dust is actually a Hebrew word, a-fa'ar. Say that with me. A-fa'ar. One more time. A-fa'ar. And what a-fa'ar means is just, the smallest possible component. The smallest possible component of the eretz, that is, that which is solid. So basically what he's saying is, to form man, to form Adam, he takes the smallest possible particle of matter, and he causes it to come together and combine to form man. Well, you and I now know what the smallest components are, right? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Look around you. Everything you see that you perceive as solid is a conglomeration of these, these three elements. It doesn't matter if it's organic. It doesn't matter if it's mineral. It doesn't matter if it's metal. It doesn't matter if it's gaseous. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything on the periodic table exists in reality because it is, it, it, it's, it's, it's a configuration of protons, neutrons, and electrons put together in a specific order, bonded by carbon or whatever, whatever is bonding it together. But that, that's what makes those elements happen. But it's all just a combination of these three things. And when the writer of Genesis, I think it was Moses, penned this because it was dictated to him by God. God told him, this is how I formed men. This is how I formed the earth. This is how I formed everything you see. I took the smallest possible components, and you're not going to believe what I'm going to share with you in another 10 minutes regarding that. I put them all together and formed it, and everything you see is formed with this stuff. How would somebody nearly 3,000 years before Jesus showed up, know that. Because the scientific quantitative eye back then, everything you looked at, this is, is, is solid. But God revealed it to the writer of Genesis as being something else. 
Take a look at this. In Hebrews chapter 11, oh, actually, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, it says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. Um, for you are dust, and to dust shall you return. Well, guess what? That's the second law of thermodynamics. That's entropy. Everything degenerates. Everything goes through en entropy, and everything simplifies in, 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 in terms of, of a molecular structure. And that's all it's saying is it all, it all degenerates back down. That's, to me, that's astonishing. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what, was, what is seen was not made out of things which are visible, but invisible. Now this word here, made out of things that are not visible, Phino menon to blepto menon, that Greek phrase is alarming. Because what the Holy Spirit was telling the writer of Hebrews, who, who I, I think it was Paul, what he was sharing with the writer of Hebrews is this that everything you see is made out of things that you that are invisible to you. But this specific tense. And this specific phrase means it's not visible to you because it's either too far, it's either too dim, or it's too small. One or the other. Everything that you see around you, this is what this, this, this scripture is declaring, everything that you see around you is made up of, it's comprised of things that are either too far for you to see. What this phrase is, is alluding to is, it, it's not a problem with the, 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 the matter itself that you're looking at, it's a problem with your eyes. You are not able to see this. It's not discern, it's not understand. It's not a lack of understanding or a lack of wisdom. This is a lack of your human eyes being able to see the components that everything around you is being made up of because it's either too far too dim. Well, I know she's not too far. I know she's not too dim because there's plenty of light in here. The only other alternative, Nancy, is you can't see what I'm made of because the components that I'm made of are too small for you to see. And this, the Holy Spirit declares to the writer of Hebrews 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the first microscope wasn't made by Bacon until about 1200. Galileo Galilei was the one who made the first compound microscope. That was in about, it was a little after the Bible, was 16, 15, 16, 16, somewhere around that, that, that time is the first time that a compound microscope was made. And that's when men became aware that, that cellular construction and the construction of matter may be made up of tiny little blocks that are smaller. But prior to that magnification principle that was instituted by Bacon in the 1200s, nobody even knew that. They thought this was solid stuff. They thought flesh was solid. But guess what? God reveals to the person who wrote Hebrews that's not the case, but that everything you see in front of you is actually made of particles and things that are too small for you to see. How many of you find that to be amazing? Because you don't see anything like that in any other religious, quote-unquote, spiritual source of literature. You only find that kind of stuff in Scripture. In, in, in Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 22, this is the King James Version now. This is, this is written in, in, in 750 B.C. This is seven and a half centuries before Jesus is born. Nearly 3,000 years ago to you and me. This is what it says. It is he that sits upon the, the circle or the sphere of the earth and the inhabitants thereof and yada yada. What I'm, I'm trying to emphasize to you is this. At a time when everybody on the planet thought the world was flat, this guy, the prophet Isaiah, writes that God told me the earth is a sphere. Not just circular or oval, but sphere. And nobody knew that. In fact, when scientists tried to declare that the world was round in the 1400s, they were executed for preaching what they interpreted at that time as heresy. Well, this is written 2,000 years prior to the 1400s. And God, if you know how to exegete Hebrew, is telling them the earth that you're on right now is not flat. But, and it's not actually circular, it's actually a sphere. 
you're sitting on a ball. Well, nobody knew that. So how would this writer know, know, how would this writer know to write that down? Unless God, the one who created reality in the first place, revealed it to him. How would it be known to the writer that the earth was a sphere? How would it be known that everything you see is made up of tiny particles that you can't see with your eyes because you can't see that small? How would anybody know that man was first constructed by the understanding and wisdom of God by taking the smallest possible particles of matter and combining them together? Who would know that? Especially given the age of these documents. And yet, that's exactly what God revealed to man. In Genesis chapter 7, uh, 7 11, it repeats what here in Job 38 16 says. Remember, Job uh, 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 is, is, is de declaring, Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? How would anybody, Job, some, some theologians believe, is the oldest book that we have? How would anybody back then, 3,000 years before Jesus showed up, Kai Kai, know that there were springs in the ocean? How deep could you... How, how, how many of you guys are divers? Nobody got me a lobster this year, but I saw them trying to dive out there. How deep can you go on a single breath? What's, what's the deepest you've ever seen anybody do, fishermen? 100 feet holding their breath? How deep do you have to go into the ocean to realize there are springs at the bottom of the sea? Could anybody do that 3,000 years ago? Okay, and yet, whoever wrote the book of Job, somebody revealed to him that there's actually underground springs at the bottom of the ocean. Not only that, but in Jonah chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, it says, The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. Sounds lovely. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought uh, my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Here he's talking about being underwater and there being mountains underwater. Well, I ask you, how would Jonah have known that? How would Jonah know that there is a landscape beneath the ocean? How would he know that there was such a thing as marine geology. How? Could he see it? Would he be able to look down in a little glass box and stare at the bottom of the sea and somehow see fathoms and fathoms and fathoms down to realize what he was looking at were springs coming out of the bottom of the ocean and mountain ranges that actually existed under the sea? So I put it to you. How would he know that? Shy of divine revelation that God told him. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life, that is Hebrew, nefesh. The life, the breath of a creature is in the blood. Now he goes on to talk about cleansing the blood, but this is what I want to point out to you. In Leviticus, when Moses was writing the law that was being dictated to the Hebrews, how would he know that blood carried oxygen? Blood to them was just a red liquid. Linda, how would he know that blood carried oxygen? When, they did, when did they discover not only that blood carried oxygen, but it was that process, that hematological process of blood carrying oxygen to the different cells and muscles in the body that allowed a man to live? Did they have that medical understanding, Matthew? 1,500 years before Jesus showed up, 3,500 years ago, did they know that? Somebody did, because that's exactly what whoever was guiding this word to be written knew and told them to write. The pneuma, the oxygen, the air, is in the blood, and that's what brings life. Luke chapter 17, verse 34. I think Jesus is a pretty smart guy. But, listen, if Jesus was no more than what they said he was, and he's just this, you know, pretty charismatic little he walking around, you know, casting spells and enchanting people and being, you know, uh, kind of like a David Copperfield type of guy and, 
you know, doing card tricks and doing the David Blaine thing and tricking a lot of people into thinking he's more than he was, how would he, say, how would he know to say this? I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, one taking the other left, two men shall be grinding the other, one taking one left, two men in the field, one taking one left. Anybody see something noteworthy there? You're talking about a night scene and a day scene in the same day. In other words, whoever said this, and according to our manuscripts it was Jesus, knew at one part of the earth it's going to be nighttime, and on another part of the earth it's going to be daytime. Who knew that back then? Because this is many, 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 many hundreds of years before anybody tried to circum... circum uh, uh, what is it called? The globe? Circumnavigate the globe? This is long before that happened. Yet, whoever said this, this Jesus, knew it is daytime in one place and nighttime in another place. Isaiah 40, chapter 23, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. Now, that's awesome and that's great, and that declares how intelligent and how wise God is. But this is what I want you to note about this passage. Whoever wrote this knows the universe is finite. Back then, when they looked up at the stars, guess how many stars they thought, they thought there were? Innumerable. No end to them. No way to count them, and yet, whoever wrote this, had it revealed to him, this prophet Isaiah, whether you believe in proto uh, Deutero, Isaiah, or you believe it was one guy, there's a theory that there were three Isaiahs and they all contributed to the construction of this book. This would have been Deutero, Isaiah, the second one. He says that the numbers are finite. That there's a certain number of stars that are set and God knows them all. He's named them. He knows each one by name. Now let me ask you, is this a lucky guess? Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Indeed, indeed, I will greatly bless you. God is saying to this person, Abraham, who they contend Genesis is not a real book. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Well, guess what? According to CNN scientists, and I don't put a whole lot of stock in CNN, but I just think it's, a, it's an interesting coincidence that when their astronomers were asked to number the stars, and you can, you can argue with me later, Joe, if you want, based upon the known universe and based upon the known you know, views they have through the kind of telescopes that they've got, they estimate there are about 70 sextillion stars out there. Well, here's the problem with all that is according to Genesis chapter 22, God is talking to Abraham, and he's basically saying the number of the stars in the sky and the number of pieces of sand on the beach are about the same. Well, gee, you know what? I did a little bit of research myself as to how many pieces of sand there are on the beach, and according to this one website, there are about five sextillion pieces of sand. You know the problem with that? Most of the, the, the shoreline has eroded away in the last thousands of years since Genesis was written, there was more sand before by about 50%, which would make five, seven and a half, which sounds a whole lot like the 76 trillion that's being talked about here. So it's almost like God isn't second-guessing himself. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, I want you to take a look at that. Two sons were born to Eber. The name was, one was named was, was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Well, I think that's interesting. I like, I like the names, and they sound kind of quizzical, but here's the thing. It says back here, approximately 5,000 years ago, the earth was divided. Well, a lot of geologists will tell you that at one time all these continents were together in one mass. How many of you have heard that theory say, say amen? And it was called, anybody know what it's called? Pangaea, right? One time, it was, and, and they try to tell you, well, it was probably 50 million years ago. The process probably took, you know, this many million years for the continents and the tectonic plates to finally shift apart. You know the only problem with that? Ocean and shoreline. What happens when ocean continues, continues to batter against the shoreline? It starts with an er and ends with erosion. It erodes. So actually, if we measure the rate of erosion on the shoreline 
And then we compress all these tectonic plates together to imagine what they would be like to form a singular mass. We can kind of estimate how long these masses have been apart in order to determine when Pangaea was moved. Well, guess what? If you talk to a geologist, you say, well, that can't be accurate because if it was, Pangaea actually split apart maybe five to 10,000 years ago. Because in the 50 million years that they're saying, all these continents would have eroded away. But they haven't eroded away. They're still there. And if you push all the tectonic plates together, guess what you see? Pangaea almost reforms. So either Pangaea was broken up and the tectonic plates moved approximately five to 10,000 years ago. Ooh, look! Right when Genesis was, was, was written and right when Peleg would have been born and uh, right when Peleg would have been living. It's almost like the Bible is actually true. Job chapter 38, verse 29. I'm almost done. I know this stuff really sends me spinning, but I may be boring the, the living daylights out of you guys. If you're bored, tell me. Go ahead. I can take it. Job verse 30, chapter 38, verse 29. From whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven who has given it birth? Water becomes hard like stone, and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. Can you bind the chains uh, or, or, uh, of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Job, if Job was written approximately 3,000 years before Jesus was born, 5,000 years ago from now, who knew there was ice in space back then? Who would have known in Israel that there were polar and Antarctic ice caps. And there were certain portions of the sea that were covered by ice. Who would have known that? And yet, whoever wrote this had it revealed to them that in space there is ice. Up in the constellations, there's ice. Who told them? How did they find out? Because here's the thing. If you ask this question to people who think you're stupid and think you're Moria because you believe in Jesus and you believe in the Bible and you ask them, so how would this, the writer of this book who penned this 3,000 years before Jesus was born, about 5,000 years ago, how would he know there was ice in space? They'll tell you, oh, well, because the book of Job was actually written in like 1964. Who's stupid now? Because this has been part of Old Testament text for thousands of years, long before there was any such thing as astronomy. And yet they knew. How? Psalm 19, verse 4, and following their line has gone throughout all the early and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has pla placed a tint for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens to the other, and its circuit, everybody say circuit, to the other end of them, and there's nothing hidden from heat. How would anybody have known the sun had an orbit? Not only that the earth had an orbit around the sun, but the sun itself moved. Even in the earliest stages of astronomy, they figured the sun was stationary. When they finally figured out it was really the earth that was moving, they figured the sun was stationary, and the earth moved around it. But whoever wrote this knew, not only does the earth have an orbit, the sun itself also has a circuit. The sun itself also has an orbit. The sun itself also moves. I put it to you, how would they have known that at the time they wrote this? Somebody had to reveal it. You get where I'm going with this whole thing. The same one who revealed the truth of these scriptures also said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The same one who revealed all this is also the same one who told you. Don't be afraid. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there now to prepare a place for you that you may be with me. If he was right here, He's right with that. Jeremiah 51, 15 says, He made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched, stretched, stretched. Nata is the word there. Out the heavens by his understanding. We actually talked about that passage before. But what that means is this. Whoever wrote this 
whoever Jeremiah was, knew that the universe didn't just ex appear ex nihilo, but actually expanded. Now what do astronomers tell us about the universe? It's constantly... How could they have known that back in Jeremiah's time? But guess what? Whoever was revealing truth to Jeremiah told him this was the case. Whoever was speaking to Jeremiah knew the universe was expanding. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For stars differ from star in glory. Guess what the first century astronomers thought? They thought every star was the same. But guess what? The Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul said each star is different. Each star is individual. Each star is unique. You want to explain to me how the Apostle Paul, trained as he was in rabbinical teachings, understood that every single star was different? All those twinkling lights that look exactly the same, he knew each one was completely different. See, here's the thing. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress. This is a very important word. Kate con tone. It means to hold back with intent. There's one thing of being in somebody's way. There's another thing of purposely holding somebody back. Okay, for instance, Jojo, stand up for a minute. Okay? Okay and try to get over there. I'm impeding him, see? I just happen to be in the way. Go back. Okay. Jojo, go over there. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. Impeding with intent. That's what the Holy Spirit says about people who actually know the truth of what I've just told you, but intentionally suppress that truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Now, take a look at this, and then we're done. For since the creation of the world, his inv invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being, un being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. It is creation itself that's supposed to validate and verify the existence of God and how right he is in what he says. Now, either you have an answer to me, for how these guys thousands of years ago knew all these things that frankly some of these facts have only been recently discovered and when I say recently I mean within the last hundred or so years or somebody that knew this stuff was telling them you want to, I, I'll, I'll leave you with one more really interesting fact if you can find a single supposedly scientific statement in the Bible that isn't true you'll be the first one in history because they've tried it and they've never been able to. How powerful is this Bible that you hold? What I want to build into you tonight is a sense of faith that what you have is not just a fable and not just a myth, but is the living, breathing, live, and active word of the living God. And he has revealed his truth to you. Can I hear an amen, and can I ask you, son, to close us with a song? Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. How great you are, Lord. How great is our God. Say it with me. How great is our God. Say it with me. How great is our God. Tell him how great you are, God, to reveal your truth in such a way and to confirm it through your creation and everything you have made. Everybody stand up. Lord, we just revel in you. We celebrate you. We want to give you praise for how powerful and, 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 and truthful you are. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Let's sing together. The splendor of the King oh. Yeah.
great is our God.